His name is John C. Calhoun. If you're into American history at all, John C. Calhoun was one of the top, he, well, he was one of the three legislators that were known, three senators that were known legendarily the first half of the 19th century, that is the 1800s. John C. Calhoun is the one of two people that was vice president with two different presidents. Two different presidents had him run for office with them. John C. Calhoun actually was people had two people from different um, parties had him run as their vice president. Um, quite a guy. Um, with a, the big three, Daniel Webster was from the, the, the north up in New England area. He was the big guy that talked uh, national government. He was a Federalist. John C. Calhoun was the guy that was from South Carolina and he was very much the states rights guy that talked the states rights proponent. The guy from Kentucky, uh, Henry Clay, was known as the great compromiser. Uh, I, I could jokingly say these guys lived in the time when the United States believed that legislators should legislate instead of just argue and actually get something done and these guys were the big leaders known very much for their power of being able to get legislation done and taken care of and work through together calhoun quite a guy well known very famous uh senator from south carolina the the state loved him talked about him you go to charleston you can see his grave it's on the opposite side of the road from his wife and his children's graves John C. Calhoun could not be buried in, uh, I think it was the Episcopal, I'm not sure which. Anyway, the church cemetery. He couldn't be buried there. He was a commoner. His wife was an actual blue blood. She and the kids could be buried, and they, they qualified to be able to be buried in the cemetery. He did not. Wasn't good enough. Today, let's talk. We've been talking about Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. We've been going through the different ones on the list. We came to this one, Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, and we've divided it up. We've been on a series of four things that talk about Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. We've talked about Christ as the high priest or the uh, hostage negotiator, the go-between. Christ is our high priest. We've talked about Christ is the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. No high priest can come without having something to offer. Jesus comes as high priest that has his own blood, his life, death, resurrection. He is the Lamb. And then we've talked about the third one as Christ as mercy seat. Christ as the mercy seat. Jesus is the one that, Revelation, I mean Romans chapter 3, you get through chapter 1, the gospel, the story of the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. The gospel that brings forward is Christ is our propitiation, the one to deflect or to turn away wrath. That is, Christ is the mercy seat, the deflector of wrath. Okay. But the subject has to come down to the subject of judgment. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary comes down to the subject of judgment. Judgment. Woo. Look at the front of your bulletin. We've got a picture there of court and walking up into the court. And if you think about it, walking up into the court as the defendant has a little bit of a to it. Take your Bible, if you would. Turn to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. Talk about judgment today. Make no apology. We will be talking about judgment. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Ooh. Remember again, though, but those that do believe in the gospel, the gospel is Jesus is the mercy seat, Jesus is the, uh, the lamb, and Jesus is 
the high priest, okay? So remember that. But again, the issue on judgment is judgment must begin at the house of God. Let's talk judgment. Let's talk judgment from the book of Revelation. Take your Bible to the back of your Bible, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. We love to read the first few verses here. We're going to do something uncomfortable and read one verse too many. Okay? One verse too many. Okay? Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of, of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and I will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the foundation of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And we say, amen. And that's the story of the new heavens remade in Jesus Christ. That's what we all look for and long for. And if we could stop right there, we would say, amen. Let's read one more verse. But, but, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, and sexually immoral, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Somebody's involved with separating which is which. That's called judgment. Ooh. Hmm. Now, when we look at that verse 8, let's remember something else. How many have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Okay. And we tend to remember that, don't we? And when we're looking in the mirror, we tend to remember that, don't we? Hmm. Mm. I'll tell you something that may sound strange. I am somebody that has grown up in church. I've grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. I don't remember. I think I was told, you can ask my mother later, she's here, but I think I was told I was in church the first week my, you know, after being born. I don't know. I don't remember. you have to ask her. But I do know I grew up in church. I've been involved with church all my life. And I've been in wrong, involved with Adventist schools almost all of my education life. And I've been around a bunch of people who are the same. And I can't tell you how many I have run into through the years who have said, you know, the Adventist message is right but it doesn't apply to me because I'm not good enough and I can't get there and I this or I that or I the other so I've got to get all I can get in this life because that's all there is for me because this other all that good stuff I read of the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 21 that doesn't apply to me I'm verse 8 I can't tell you how many times I have heard that it saddens me. If you take your Bible and you turn to Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 5, 25, Jesus is telling when, uh, when the Father, when Jesus comes, he tells this parable or this story about when he comes, picking it up with 20 verse 21. 
And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will gather before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. That's judgment, folks. Ooh. And you know what? When I remember that the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, funny thing happens along the way. A lot of you look more like goats than you do like sheep. And when I look in the mirror, I see more horns than I do a nice pretty face. Scary business, this judgment stuff. Old John C. Calhoun, everything that he did, and it still wasn't good enough to end up in the right cemetery. My aunt was my babysitter. Lifelong, good Roman Catholic. The last years of her life were not good, were not friendly, were not kind to her. She died slow, she died painful, she died awful. Talking about religious things, and she would say, oh, that's not nice to hear about that God and to hear about those things and the things you believe. I'll stay right where I am because I'm going to be buried in a Catholic cemetery. She wasn't. When she died, her daughter had her buried in the community, the community cemetery. Eighteen or nineteen months later, her husband died. He too, he had converted to be a good Roman Catholic when he married her. Um, member of the Roman Catholic Church, his health was not good the last parts of his life. Uh, he stayed with his daughter, who was attending a different denominational church setting. Uh, Aunt Evelyn did have a Catholic funeral, but she was not buried in the Catholic cemetery. When Uncle Mike died, they called the priest for health reasons. He had not what, traveled the 18 miles from where they lived out in the country over to the, to the big city of 18,000 where the church was. And a new priest had come in who didn't know Uncle Mike, and he said no, he wouldn't give him a Catholic funeral. Wouldn't do it. Wasn't Catholic enough. My, that's been 30 years ago now. My cousin still has that sticking in her craw when I get seeing with her, her memory of that. Not good enough. Well, we can talk about Calhoun and kind of laugh. We can talk about people of other groups and we can kind of say, well, you know, whatever. Can I see if I can make you a little uncomfortable? May I bring it closer to home? It was 1995. It was January of 1995. I was, Jenny and I were recently married and we had started in a new pastorate. The place that I had been the last four years, I got a call from a guy. Jim, will you come? I said, sure. You see, what had happened was their son, their, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, something, I don't remember his exact age. Anyway, there had been a flash flood, and a bridge had been taken out. And Alan was driving home, and he didn't know that the bridge was taken out. And what would normally be a simple little creek was a fast-flowing river, and when the car went down in it, he didn't stand a chance. They found him two days later. At the funeral... And I was there. I did come. The, the night before the funeral, laid out in the funeral home in his casket, pandemonium broke out when one of his friends, now understand, this young gentleman had grown up as Adventisty as I had. Um, somewhere along in there, he and the academy had parted ways. 
They had parted ways, whether it was his idea or the school's idea or a combination of both or what. You know, they had parted ways before his graduation. And one of his friends that was with him that knew a few things of some of the things that had to do with some of the things that were going on, well, he's laying there in his casket, pandemonium broke out. Mother was very... Somebody had to do something quick. One of his grieving friends that was a grieving friend with him tried to put a cigarette in his pocket, in his suit, there in his casket. Now remember again, this is a good Adventist boy in an Adventist family with Adventist mom and dad. Did he have a habit? Yes, he did. Mom didn't want him waking up on Resurrection Day with that thing in his pocket. Um, horror broke out. Because mom was having a big problem with the idea of that thing sitting in his pocket. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from dad. Jim, I just had to tell you. I just had to tell you. I had to tell you, it is good news, great news. My son did not have alcohol in his system when he died. We just got the talk screen. That was weighing heavily on dad's mind. Why? Personally, it didn't make that big of a deal to me whether he did or didn't have it in his system. Had he been one that was having a trouble with that kind of stuff? Yes. Have I got you uncomfortable yet? Let's see if I can make you a little more uncomfortable. It reminded me of something that had happened two years, three years before, a few years before. I had been pastor of this district for a little while, and just after I left, again, this was another one that something had happened just after I had left. Gratefully, they didn't ask me back into this one, and I'm, oh, am I glad. One of the young men in the church um, decided he was no longer comfortable with life, and he took his own life. And there was no question he took his own life, and there was no question that he meant it. I mean, he didn't leave any room for doubt. He made sure he took care of the job. What do you do at that funeral? Understand, there are whole groups of people that will not allow somebody that has, been, that has committed suicide to be buried in their cemeteries. The reason goes like this, theologically. You gotta be, every sin has to be confessed first, and if it isn't, and since uh, killing yourself is the last thing you do, that isn't confessed, so. Have I got you uncomfortable yet? By the way, that theology is not mine. I don't happen to believe that. The pastor at that funeral preached from Acts chapter 28. I still love it to this day. I'm so glad that that guy that had a few more years than I did and knew a few more things than I did preached the funeral because I would have been lost. What to do with this? He preached from Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 28, you have the story of Paul uh, being a prisoner and, and, and on a prison ship headed to Rome and they have shipwreck and they end up on Malta. Acts chapter 28 is in Malta and are on the island. And they, the ship is destroyed and the prisoners are come up there and there's Paul in chains. And the good natives think, aha, he's in chains. He's gotta be a terrible person and have done terrible things. And then, they're all, it's, it's raining and everybody's wet and they're trying to start a fire and as you remember what happened Paul was one of the ones that went out gathering stuff to try and start a fire remember and he's trying he's packing it down what happened a, a viper a very deadly snake bites him on the hand and he just kind of shakes the thing off into the fire but what did the natives the locals what did they think oh my here this guy was rescued from the waters 
but God is going to kill him anyway, and this is what justly belongs to him because of how terrible he is. And when he didn't die, what did the natives think, the locals? Oh, well then he must be a god. <laughs> and the pastor said, Maybe we ought to be a little careful about deciding who's going to end up where and under what circumstances. Why don't we leave that alone? And could I take you back to Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and our belief in it should make us the happiest people on earth because the one that is my judge is the one that is my mercy seat, is the one who is my high priest, is the one that is my lamb. He is the sacrifice for me. He is the gospel for me. He's the one that is my judge. Not some of us that might get excited about who's a god and who isn't and who's whatever. Hmm. You see, the issue of judgment comes down to, and then what? And we can talk all we want about theories of it's really nice, but when we're the one laying there in the bed looking up and then the story is told, time is running out, and then what is a big deal? I've dealt with people, prayed with people who were, but pastor, you don't understand. I want to be buried by my wife or my husband. I want to be buried in the church cemetery. It's a big deal to some people. More importantly to that than that, Revelation 21. Does verse 7 apply to me? Or am I one of the ones in verse 8? Ooh, and I know my history. Ooh, and I would come back to. Would you look at the verse of Scripture that Sophia read for us this morning? Would you look at John chapter 5? John chapter 5. And what does it say? Verse 22, for the Father judges nobody, but has committed how much judgment? To who? Jesus is my judge. And that's the best news in the world. Because I'm not sure I want my case coming up in front of you. And some of us, oh, North Carolina. North Carolina is one of the states that is, or at least was, I don't know, in the last few years. But about 10 years ago, North Carolina was one of the top states in the country for homeschool, homeschoolers, okay? The homeschooler movement was huge in North Carolina about 10 years ago. And we had several from our church that was involved with it. But it has some picky laws as to exactly what you can do and what you can't. And, and it get, got really kind of tricky. And what qualifies as a homeschool and what does not and what is going on. And I remember calling and asking about it. And I was talking to somebody about it. And understand, you're getting into the school movement and family movement. And government is scared to death to deal with the subject. But it's just, it's just a mess all the way around of what qualifies and what does not as far as homeschool. Well, okay, what is a homeschool? A bunch of people of our church were involved in it. I finally was after this one told me to talk to that one who told me to talk to that one who told me to talk to the other. I finally got a hold of this lady that would talk to me that was huge in the homeschool movement. 
And uh, what I really wanted to know is what qualifies as homeschool as opposed, uh, as opposed to somebody teaching where it's wink, wink, nod, nod, but really this person is teaching in, in the school. And, and I kept asking about this, and the lady said, you don't understand, sir. We have this homeschool movement that has hundreds of kids in it, but the parents are the teachers but they come to these other classes for enrichment. I said, yeah, yeah, right, enrichment versus school. Yeah. She says, no, no, no. The enrichment is we, the parents teach the kids and all the things that are going on, but we come together for something that we can't teach personally, and that's an enrichment class. And I said, okay, now you're getting me where I want to be. Who gives the grades in that enrichment class? She says, Pastor, you haven't been involved with the homeschool movement much, have you? I said, no, I haven't, but my question is a serious one. If the teacher goes to give your kid an A, what are you, what, that's the grade they're going to get, right? She says, you sure haven't been involved with the homeschool movement much. She says, I don't care what that homeschool enrichment teacher says about what my kid says. If that teacher says they get, my kid gets an A, but I think it's a C, the kid gets a C because I'm the teacher, not the enrichment person. That's homeschool. And then she hit the point that I'm getting at here. She said, believe me, sir, I'm a whole lot harder on my son than any, than any of those other people would be. Let me tell you something else I'm greatly relieved about. I'm greatly relieved that I am not the judge in my case. How many of you would be harder on yourself or your kid than somebody else would be? And I have good news for you. Jesus is your judge. Jesus is our judge. That's what he says. Jesus is the judge. Now can I make you even more uncomfortable? What's going on in John chapter 5? What's happening here in John chapter 5? Where are we and why? What does this verse, verse 22, what is it doing there? What's going on in the chapter that has verse 22 sitting in the middle of it? Do you remember what's going on? Where does John chapter 5 begin? What's going on? Verse 1, And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew, What? Bethesda. What's going on at Bethesda? What's going on at Bethesda is pretty simple. A rumor has gone out generations before that when the water bubbles, somebody will, and the first person in gets in there gets healed. This has been going on for generations. Mobs of people in different stages of disrepair are hanging there together mobs. Jesus comes walking through and he looks at one guy and says, would you like to be healed? The Bible says the man has been there laying there for a long time. It says he has been struggling with the infirmity that is literally about to kill him, and he has been struggling with this infirmity for 38 years. And Jesus looks at him and says, would you like to be healed? He gives the answer, well, Pretty obviously the answer was one that um, my kids would give the answer like this. Duh. <laughs> but notice, if you will, look at the verses. The guy says, the guy doesn't say, even say, yes, I want to be healed. Notice if we look at what the guy is saying, he says, I'm too weak to get to the water first. Notice his answer. Would you like to be healed? Yes, but it's beyond hope for me. Do, do you hear his, yeah, I'd like to be healed, but I can't get there. It's beyond hope for me. He's sitting there looking at Jesus and he says, I'm beyond hope. Can I tell you how many times I've heard that one? I'm beyond hope. 
And can I tell you again, I am so glad that Jesus is my judge. Not some of us who think of ourselves as beyond hope. Moving on. In the rich story. Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. Now, folks, the, the, the guy wasn't on a king-sized mattress with a box springs under it, okay? This wasn't, when Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, he wasn't talking about how to put a king-sized bed on your head and walk away. We're talking about, think throw rug. That's really what, we're talking a rug, okay? Think throw rug on your, in your kitchen. Roll it up, stick it under your arm, walk away. That's what Jesus said to him. And he did. And what's the response that the guy gets? You can't do that. Who told you to do that? The guy says, I was so stunned with somebody that came up to me and said, take up your bed and walk, that I didn't even look at his face to know what he looked like. I just did it. Jesus comes back to him in the temple. We don't know if it was the next same day or the next day or when. Jesus comes to him in the temple and says, by the way, don't go back to what you did or you'll end up right back where you were. Now, that isn't all that scientifically earth-shaking, what he just told the guy. If you go to have a bypass surgery, they'll basically tell you if you don't clean up your act, you'll be right back here in five years to do this again. Okay? Nothing new about what Jesus told the guy. But when Jesus said that, the guy goes into his... Can I say it like the, um, can I say it like the, like the commercial on TV? He went into his happy dance, yeah. The guy goes into his happy dance, and he starts getting in his happy dance, and he says, that's the guy that told me, that's the guy that told me. Now Jesus is in big trouble. And it's in that context that we're in. Can I say something to you to make you mad? Remember, folks, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I believe in the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Remember that when I tell you this, okay? When Jesus is trying to save somebody, that is not the time to interrupt him and try to talk doctrine. Get out of the way! Let him do it. Jesus is my judge. And we're feeling, when you're feeling despair and you're saying, whoa, I don't know if he'll save a dirty wretch like me because I this and I that or I that or I whatever. Wait a minute. Would he have come to be high priest? Would he have come to be lamb? Would he have put himself out to be mercy seat if he was in the destruction business? No! Jesus is my judge. And that's the best news possible. Back to John 5. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. Wait a minute. What do you mean he is he's, he's not, not in the judgment? The answer is so simple. It is so simple. Now, maybe I should say something else first. The first thing he said is, you have everlasting life. Maybe we shouldn't get tangled up in the details of what he says after that, and we should just say amen to that part. Okay? But the part where he says you pass through judgment and you don't have to worry, that's pretty simple. Anybody knows anything about judgment, there's three phases to judgment, any judgment. There's the guilt or not guilty phase, and then there's the penalty phase, and then there's the carrying out of the sentence phase. Folks, 
If you're called not guilty, what do you have to worry about in the sentence phase and the carrying it out phase? Zero. If you're declared not guilty, the judgment is over for you at that point right there. There is no discussion about what's the penalty and how, who, how is it going to be carried out. That's all Jesus is saying. Remember again. Please don't go out of here saying Pastor Hakes is teaching cheap grace. Please don't do that. The verse from last week. 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. Is anybody saying go sin it up? No. My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. Don't do it. Stay away from it. It'll cause you more heartache and headache than you can ever imagine. You don't want to go there. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And He is the mercy seat deflecting wrath on all of us. Am I a universalist? Yeah, kind of. How many people did Jesus come to save? That's universalism. Now, am I believing that everybody will take him up on it? No. But that's our choice. But how many does God want to save? And it's not about doing this or doing that. Oh, maybe we ought to go back. Verse 8 in uh, Revelation. Verse 8 in Revelation 21. But there won't be a coward, and there won't be, and one of the things that says there won't be there is a murderer. You know any murderers? Have you read about any murderers? Say in your Bible. How about David? How about Paul? Okay. Uh, idolaters. Remember a fellow named Jacob? Remember when the father-in-law was all ticked off and came to see Remember, what was, what was Rachel sitting on? Idolatry was in his home. Um, oh, sexually immoral? Do we know any of them? How about King David? Oh, boy. In fact... He works out real good here for, for the illustration of, you know, with all, you can say with all the rest, you can safely say, yeah, but that was before. That was before. He, he got over that. Oh, yeah, David got over that. Do you remember how they checked out to see if he was alive at the end or dying or not at the end of his life? It'd make us a little uncomfortable. They found a virgin and they threw her in his bed. When that didn't get David excited, they knew he was dying. <laughs> now, let's not get into their histories. is no better than mine or anybody else's. And praise God when it comes to looking to Jesus. And when we get to the subject of looking to Jesus and, and the overcomers will have eternal life with him, we're not going to sit there looking at each other's dirty laundry. So let's not go back and look at it that way. Let's just say those guys struggled with their humanness. Can we put it that way? And they understood full well that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in a sinful world. But Jesus is my judge. And he's your judge. The one who is our mercy seat is my judge. The one who is the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. The one who died as sacrificial lamb is my judge. The one who is the high priest, the negotiator, is my judge. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary is Christ. Jesus is my judge. Get out of the way and let him do it. 
Don't go arguing with him about you forgot this or you need to check on that or whatever. Can we be people of faith enough as the song you choir members sang for us? We're the people of faith. Can we be people of faith enough to let Jesus be the judge and not try to help him? Can we do that? Jesus is my judge. And it is the best news out there. It is shocking news. It is, what is the news, guys? The news is the seventh day is the Sabbath. That was early 1800s. Try that one now and it won't get you very far. Shocking news, folks. Jesus is my judge. And man, is that good news. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is our high priest. We thank you that Jesus is the lamb. We thank you that Jesus is the mercy seat. Oh, but we thank you that Jesus is our judge. Help us to sing, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And help us to read the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 21 and say, by faith, because of Jesus, it applies to me. Because Jesus is my judge. Thank you, Jesus.